Please be seated. It does come up on occasion when someone has taken ill uh, here in the, either the, our immediate congregation or a relative thereof, and the conversation might turn to, oh, would you like to be included on the prayer list? And there's usually a pause. I think this, this maybe this New England, oh, no, I'm good, um, self-reliant, I don't need, you know, either I don't need the prayers or probably more accurately, I don't know if I want everyone to know. Uh, if my name is there, you know, it's private, right? If I'm ill, but... And so the, the phrase that comes to me, and I love it, um, not original with me, but I heard it once said, I've never forgotten it, worse than everyone knowing is no one knowing. And that is so true. So I want to take that phrase and kind of use it in a slightly different way. Um, better than going to your sacred place by yourself or in addition to going to your sacred place all by yourself, away from everybody so that no one knows, even as good or better than that, is everyone knowing about your experience there and how it has changed you. Wednesday this past week, uh, people came and, and quite wonderfully shared uh, instances, examples, memories of places where they have gone. Uh, the, the theme was nature, so people brought in little mementos, and, and these particular mementos spoke of a place that even now um, people among us go to. Uh, they go to this sacred place. Why? And I'm going to give you a little words from Joseph Campbell and, and William Blake here in a moment, but in my words, we go there um, to get away from. Right? Wait, <laughs> New England phrase, change is good as a rest. Uh, if you can just change your, your scene, just pop out and go somewhere, that alone is restful. But if you can go to a place, and now here's the words of William Blake coming, you know, if you can go to a place where they can't find you, or namely, as he puts it, Satan, can't find you. I hear Satan to be all the demands and all the, just the things that are life. The things that when we're getting up and moving through the day, there are lots of things you got to remember and there are things you got to do. And, and there's so much of that that you can sort of lose, quite truly, your bearings, your kind of sense of, wait a minute, where do I end and, and what people want of me begin? You know, so you leave and go to that place and some of the images from Wednesday, you know, a, 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 along a, a sweet little quiet brook in the woods um, or uh, a place, you know, in a tree um, where someone walking by doesn't even know you're there. The, 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 the need we have to go to such a place in order to taste and be truly, it, it's a real thing. This isn't just made up, right? We go to those places and we can name the places, but when you're there, what happens to you is sort of unseen. There's a feeling there of coming back to who you are, of coming to know your, remember really who you are and kind of what you're about and what it is you could be and what it is you could be for others. And in that place, there's a presence. And that presence is bigger than something you can comprehend or get a, or fully know, but that presence knows you fully. That's the feeling, and we love it. But better than that is returning from that place, which is not easy. And therefore, perhaps the reason why so many of us who love to go to those places keep them kind of, we don't talk about it. Stephanie Bradbury is a colleague of mine who had a near-death experience, and for years she couldn't talk about it especially as a, an Episcopal priest, because that experience was, to begin with, so transformative and real. The piece of it that, that, that she cannot let go of or can't let go of her is this eternal, eternal dimension. It's, it's a taste of something that 
is in this world, but not of this world. She, her, it changed her life. She, from that point forward, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, Stephanie, um, knew no fear. People who have near-death experiences, at least the one thing they bring back is a kind of, I know I'm good because there's more. But the challenge to say, hey, um, can I share with you that this thing that happened to me? They don't go there, especially if they're Christian, because what is already established, call it the law, the doctrine, whatever, whatever we've inherited from our forebears, is, it's hard to break that open and squeeze something new and fresh, you know, old wineskin, something fresh that, that doesn't so stretch it, breaks it. But so, so Stephanie has developed an online group. They meet once a month. And it's, it's people who have had near-death experiences. And, and they can share with one another what happened to them and how it's changed their life. And what I think is happening there as well is they're beginning to make that which was sort of unseen now something that they share. And if you share anything, no matter how unseen, doesn't it become seen? Doesn't it become now something that you can talk about and say, this is real? And, and so they, they share that, but it's not easy. So I want to briefly speak of faith. So Paul, in one of his letters, says that faith is the conviction of that which is unseen. And, and if you kind of just sort of hear that, you think, oh, all right, well, unseen means not real. Unseen means, you know, belief in, in sort of a dream. But that's not the case. Faith is what you need to go to the wilderness, to go to that place, knowing that if you go there, you will be touched by that which is unseen, but is real. And it changes you. And then you come back, and now faith again is asking you to remain true to that, even against all odds, even when your family, your friends, your church is saying, what are you thinking? What, who, who is this person who's come back from? And that's Peter. Jesus has come back. He's been in the wilderness. He's been saturated with this presence that has allowed him to be convicted in who he is and what he's being called to do. When you go there and you stay there long enough, something happens. Maybe it doesn't happen immediately, but something happens that gives you direction, that reminds you that there is something within that you need to share, that you need to say to the world that the world hasn't heard because you uniquely have it to say. They don't even know they're not hearing it because you haven't told them. They're, we all go there and come back with a gift to give, but delivering that gift takes courage. I'm going to do a little intermission here for a moment and sort of underscore this point with William Blake and Joseph Campbell. William Blake, I'm paraphrasing slightly, old English might get lost on you, so I'm kind of... There is a moment and a place in every day where Satan cannot find you, nor can his watch fiends find you or find it, but the persevering, the industrious, find this moment and multiply it perhaps by going there repeatedly. And once it's found, it renovates, it, 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 it renews every moment of your day if rightly placed. I find that last part, Kedemich, if rightly placed. In other words, if integrated into the rest of your life. You go there, find that place where the devil can't find you, and there's this refreshment, this renovation. And when you come back, Every moment of your day looks different, looks better, may I say, if you can bring it back. Joseph Campbell, a sacred place is a term I like to use now as an absolute necessity for anybody today. You must have a room or a place, a certain hour a day or so, <laughs> this is the best part, where you do not know what was in the newspapers that morning. You do not know 
who your friends are. You do not know what you owe to anybody. You do not know what anybody owes to you. But a place where you can simply experience and bring forth what you are and what you might be. This is the place of creative incubation. And first, you may not, at first, you may find that nothing's happening there. But if you have a sacred place and use it and take advantage of it, something will happen. So it's Peter who says to Jesus, you, you, you can't do this. Jesus is so very clear about who he is and where he's going. I mentioned this morning with Episcopal Church 101, we were doing the Book of Common Prayer. And I got a little of this and probably not enough of this uh, in seminary. Lee Mitchell was our liturgical professor and he wrote a book on liturgy. And at the very beginning of the book, he speaks of the Paschal mystery. And I thought, ooh, when I began to hear that and I think understand it, I thought, that's it. I'm not here in seminary. I'm not here as a priest even 35 years later because I think if I believe something with my mind, I'm going to be different. If I say, oh, I believe that, th that's not going to do it. But, a la the Shema, you know, here we are in Lent in every service. What does the Lord require? You know, love the Lord your, your God with all of you, not just your head, but your mind, your soul, your heart, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The Paschal mystery is that, that if you are willing to get on board in your way and be convicted that what you've known when you've gone to your sacred place and how that has changed you and how that has given you something that you know somewhere in your mind, heart and soul, you need to share. That the world would be actually a better place if you did. That coming back and doing that is like stepping onto the Paschal mystery because it costs you something. And it's so easy, you know, writ large to see Jesus and what he suffered to be true to himself and to be true to what he believed to be this, this law that if you lead with love, you're gonna get into trouble. But would he do otherwise? No. So he gets on this path and he suffers and he's telling his disciples, this, this is going to happen and I'm at peace with it. And Peter is thinking, what is the method of your madness? What are you, what are you thinking? And, and, and he's like, no, get behind me. I'm, I'm moving forward. And I think for me, the reason it becomes so clear that Jesus with, with I mean, we're not by stepping on this path, necessarily going to end up crucified. But he can be on that path because he remembers faith, right? He remembers that when each of us have gone to that place and have tasted that presence that we can't fully comprehend, but that knows us fully, that presence is eternal. It's not going anywhere. And when you're part of that and you come back onto this path and you want to share even a part of that, no matter what comes your way, you're still living in the presence of the eternal. You're, you're on this, this paschal mystery, the, the roller coaster of love that endures all things and believes all things and hopes all things and, and never ends. And so we step on that path because we've, we've, we've tasted. I mean, love is eternal. It's just another word for that presence. And I always want to be in that presence and I'm it's going to be hard as hell but I'm going to come back and I'm going to stay true to that no matter how hard Stephanie Bradbury and her friends you know 
There's, there's something like 10 million people in our country alone who have had a near-death experience, and I wouldn't have known that because they're still trying to find their courage to, to work with one another, to say, you know that unseen thing that we, we, we have trouble even talking about? Yeah, the more we can share that, the more it's gonna become real. So I end today, this morning, with something that wonderfully, thank you, Deb Kutcher, who, you know, I, somehow after hearing 30 people, wonderful, say what it was that, that was their place, how nature kind of, there was the, you know, the obvious question in the room, in my mind, like, all right, well, why, why, why not stay in nature? Why not every Sunday go to the beach or go to your sacred place? And, and that is an option and not a bad one. But it's, it occurs to me that, and this is what community, there's, there's a role, you know, we're here for a reason. And, and if, if anything, or anything more, it seems to me, that reason is me giving you uh, a little encouragement. And I need it too. And you giving me a little encouragement. And together, we find the wherewithal to not only go to that place where no one can find us and be with that presence, that takes courage, that takes faith, but to come back, to come back and to bring that, however hard, into the world. And that's where I think the community piece comes in, that when we can all talk about this and make the unseen seen and shared, we've got a deeper conviction about its reality. And it might just actually, and only in that way, you know, actually be something good for the world.